Hey everybody, uh, my name is Dan, I'm here from DBC, I'm in one of my instructors. Uh, I'd like to uh, welcome you everybody, uh, great to see so many come around. Uh, we have two great speakers tonight, we have Adian and we have Tuxi. Uh Both have been uh, contributing to open source for a long time. Uh, Adian is working for AT&F and Tuxi is coming from Fortbot. Uh, I think everybody knows Paperclip and similar uh, open source gym. Um, they will do some introduction and some light coding. So let's give them a hand and thank you for coming on. Hello, thank you for having us. I'll step in front of the camera. Um, yeah, really excited to be here. My name is Aiden. I'm Tute. Thank you. Uh, thank you all. I'm excited to be here as well. Yeah, so uh, Tute and I have known each other through a while, for a while through uh, tech meetups in the community uh, and have the past like year and a half or so have been running uh, open source workshops. So we're both you know active contributors to open source. I think a lot through our jobs, but also just because we have nothing better to do. And the, you know, we're, we're seeing a lot of people that are interested in open source but aren't really sure how to get started. And so that's kind of what we wanted to talk, talk to you about today. So yeah, we've been running, we've been running workshops um, and we're gonna be organizing another one probably soon. But um, yeah, to actually get some hands-on experience. But uh, for tonight, we're gonna sort of like talk through the process and demonstrate it. So um, I should also say, uh, feel free to interrupt with questions. <laughs> So, you know, the first thing, and these are, um, you know, poor man's slides, by the way. Uh, so, yeah, the first question I think is like, why should I contribute? Why, why would anyone even care uh, about doing this? So, you know, I think the first big thing is that there's really nothing, no piece of technology in the world that you use that is not impacted or a user of open source. Your car, your phone, your video game system, your refrigerator probably, you know, every single one of these things has code in it and that code probably uh, involves uh, open source. So, um, you know, for, for all of you, how many of you would, would uh, put yourself in the bucket of like learning to code? Okay, so it's a lot of people, right? How many people are, tr you know, working towards trying to get a job uh, as a developer? Okay, so for all of you, um, I wouldn't say it's a requirement, but I would say it is a strong uh, positive to have open source contribution and for you know, potential employers to be able to see that. You know, there's a lot of benefits in that it can show your technical abilities, it can you know, show your code uh, without you even having to send it to them. Um, it can show how you interact with people, you know, um, how you collaborate. And, uh, yeah, you know, it's it kind of shows that you're interested in giving back. So, you know, whether it's open sourcing your own code or contributing to other open source projects, um, both are, are going to be really beneficial in sort of building out your portfolio. We're going to be mostly talking about the latter tonight, which is contributing to existing open source projects. So, um, oh yeah, the other the other reasons for why you might contribute. So, you're going to sharpen your skill set. You're going to be working with code that is often like more complex, you know, especially if you're early on uh, in, your, in your coding career, it's probably going to be more complex than anything you've worked on, right? These are, um, these are projects that are often used by lots of people um, that are often having to hook into, you know, Rails or whatever framework you're using, that kind of thing. Uh, and so you will definitely learn something. Also, by contributing code, uh, you're often going to be code reviewed, and so you're going to get feedback uh, in a way that maybe you're not used to. So, you know, the last sort of cool thing is that by contributing, your code can be used in some really interesting places. So, you know, lots of companies produce open source, and that open source is, is used around the world. Um, government nonprofits uh, often uh, open source their projects, and they, you know, could really use the help. So. Yeah, a couple examples. Yeah, I wanted to show, for example, this uh, college scorecard. That's a project that was started in 18F, which is a federal agency. And 
uh, helps you check w what is the best return on the investment of studying in a certain university. So you can go here and see how much would it be to do a certain career in a certain place and what's the average salary after you attended. If you find any error or anything that's confusing or something that doesn't work well in your device or it's just hard to understand or to read for yourself, you can go into this project's uh, board of work like the, the project management software that they use and tell them I had this problem and just tell them so that they are aware, the team who is behind of this. And also you can actually contribute and what you contribute will make it better for everyone. So it's a way of, of learning from what they have done and improve it as you, as you see fit. The other one that I want to, to mention, for example, is the Crime Data API, that because it's open and freely available for every one of you, you can just read it and do, for example, fact checking. Like when we are uh, reading news and see, and somebody says that there's certain crime rate in certain city and it's going up or down and so on, we can go here and this open data that we have from the government and read it and put interfaces online so that journalists or, or people can make use of it. Uh, and if you do it in an open source way, people can actually contribute to your same project and in a way that would, it's better than if these two people would have been individually working on it by themselves. So there are two projects I want to mention there. Yeah, um, you know, another example is that uh, I have this you know, little JavaScript plugin that I built, I don't know, maybe a year ago. Uh, and all it does is add a table of contents to your page. You know, it reads your, reads your headings and from your HTML and just inserts a table of contents. Nothing super complicated. Uh, someone just filed an issue kind of out of nowhere uh, a few days ago, and it turns out the plugin is being used by the city of Ottawa, Canada. Which is cool, you know, it's like, the, there's, I, I put this out there, I, I don't know, it has, you know, 20 stars or something. There's not. It's not like it's getting, um, you know, written up in the news or anything, but a government, some, you know, somewhere that really needs it, is is able to reuse that code because it was made available, right? And you know, you're never going to be able to anticipate, you know, who can benefit from from your project. So I'd strongly encourage, you know, anything that you build to, you know, put it up, make it available, um, and yeah, if you can contribute to other projects, you know, there's there's then many people that can benefit from that contribution. Any, any questions or anything uh, thus far? Yeah. I mean, it's not surprising that like, open source is pretty much a good website, but I didn't expect it to actually be like Fridge or something like I mean, like in yeah. like, Mac computer, like, I thought it's, I wouldn't expect that actually like Apple would use anything like open source. I mean, it's kind of, if it's really, it's true, it's kind of, I mean, is, is it really like something in the fridge or in the car? Like, like yeah, so I mean, if not, if not directly in the systems of that, uh, of that device, it's going to be in the systems of the, you know, people that, uh, you know, the machines that built that product, or it's going to be in the, you know, design software that, you know, the, the industrial designer used to, to build that thing. Right, so it's all it's all interconnected, and by having you know the, the code be open source, more it just allows more people to benefit from it. I'll show you an example that today. So in Twitter, one second, this friend bought a Chevrolet Bolt, which is the electric car. He's very very happy, and today he got this window that said uh, this car is running GPL software, and because it has this license, then uh, you can request the code in the internet and see how are we controlling your car with software, basically. Yeah. So it was in the dashboard telling this person that he could access that software. And if he wanted, modify it and do whatever he wanted. Yep. So anyway, um, <laughs> so yeah, open, sor open source is eating the world. Uh, and, th and that's only increasing, <coughs> by the way. So um, what is open source? Open source is a code that's freely av available for you to download and study and read and modify and publish again with your modifications. Technically, it will need a license. That's why in open source projects, you will see the license file that tells you that uh, you can do the things. Otherwise, uh, it would be technically illegal, but everything that's in GitHub is pra practically open source. Uh, another example I want to show today was a farm bot. Farm bot is a bot, a robot that automates farming. And so you can like buy this kit with the software and hardware that they built in order to have your own set of vegetables in your backyard. 
the thing is that aside from building a business, because they sell the hardware and the software, you can also download the software and the, and the diagrams with the hardware and the pieces that you need so that you can do it yourself, whatever you are. If you don't want to pay this company to do it, you can build it yourself. And if you find an improvement to make, same thing. You just improve it and build it up alongside the many customers that they have and users. I should so. also mention that that kind of thing um, where you know a product is sold uh, but then also open source is especially important in you know like developing countries for example where maybe you can't order that thing right uh, or there's like some import export regulation where you can't you know get that from that company but people in those in those places need these things and by having you know these products released as open source which is an increasingly common thing as well. Um, that can be, you know, sort of used and adapted um, by people who, again, really need it. That's right. Open collaboration is not the same as open source. Yeah. So, yeah, we, you know, t we talk about open source, and it really just means just that that the source code is open, that it's available for you to see and use, um, and that the license says that you can distribute it and um, and modify it. When Contributing to open source, which is really what we're talking about uh, tonight, the you know important thing to look for is code that is collaborated on in the open. So there are some projects like Android, the actual operating system for the phone, that are open source in the sense that the code is available and the code is uh, you know reusable, and that's actually why you see you know different companies having like their own flavor of Android, right? That you. you your Samsung phone and it looks a certain way, and you know your HTC phone and that'll look a certain way. That's because they've all adapted the source code from Google. But Android is not uh, collaborated <coughs> on in the open, right? The developers are not, um, you know, sort of doing all of their work, making all of their their code contributions, keeping track of their uh, to dos essentially, uh, in a way that anyone can. Right? It, they're doing it internally, and then it's referred to as throwing the code over the wall. Right? So it's like, okay, we're done with it. Now you can see it. So, you know, with things being on GitHub or Bitbucket or uh, GitLab, these projects uh, are most often going to be, you know, collaborated on the open, where you can see all the outstanding issues. You can comment and say, you know, I experienced this too, or you can file a new issue, uh, that kind of thing. So. Yeah, that's something, we'll talk more about that in a second. That's something that you want to look for in contributing because that means that you, you know, can see, what, there's nothing behind the scenes really, there's nothing behind the curtain. If you have any question, as always, uh, feel free to ask. All right, so that brings us to how do I select an open source project? Let's, you know, now that we've decided that, that it's an important thing to do and that uh, it's something we want to do, how would you think about even finding a project to contribute to? So, the first thing that is going to you know, make contributing most interesting to you is if it's a project that you use. You know, I'm sure all of you, as um, you know, members of Dev Bootcamp or, or you know, going through whatever classes or, or, or learning that you're doing, are installing a ton of open source software. You know, Rails or Paperclip or you know, Bootstrap or whatever you might be using. All these things are open source, and all of them need your help. So, you know, the first thing that would be most useful is finding a project that you use and are interested in, because that will make it more interesting to contribute to, right? And you'll be able to benefit from those contributions, as will anyone else using the project. So, that's a that's a you know primary sort of characteristic, and uh, you know the other benefit there is that you'll have the context to understand how the project works. You're not just walking in uh, to a project sort of blind. You know, you've experienced what that project's like to use and can therefore you know, think meaningfully about, okay, the next steps, like how could I have made that experience better? Or how could, you know, what could this have, what feature could this have that would make it more useful to me? Or where did I run into a problem that I could help the next person uh, from falling into? By the way, these, sli these slides, uh, I posted the link in the meetup. Uh, event, so so don't worry about like taking notes. Or anything. Um, so yeah, you know another great thing is like if you know a maintainer, right? Having someone 
on the other side of the project who can actually walk you through the code, can give you guidance and mentorship, et cetera, or you know, sort of point to a good place to start in terms of contributing, that will be a huge uh, thing as well. If you ever need help finding those people, you know, Tuesday and I are, are available and we'll put our contact information on at the end. So let's say you don't um, know a maintainer and you're, you're just going and looking at a project. You might want to, you know, dig through some of the open issues and pull requests, or even closed issues or pull requests, and see, you know, have has the project been receptive to contributors in the past, right? So if it's not going in and I'm going to fix this bug that I just ran into, or I'm going to add this feature that I just thought would be nice, you know, if you're finding a project and you're like, you know, I really would like to become more involved in this, um, you might look at past issues and see, you know, kind of how supportive the maintainers or the community are, and that might, you know, get you more excited or less excited about, about contributing, but it'll be informative. <coughs> so, you know, you also might want to check that the project is active. You know, is it, um, is it getting new new changes merged? Is it getting new issues opened and closed? You know, are people responding, et cetera? And you know, are they keeping the project well organized? And that, you know, are they are they labeling their issues and and you know triaging? Right. Will, will someone respond to you and kind of uh, help you think through the issue, that kind of thing. So for the workshops that we run, uh, you know, we, we have a handful of GitHub organizations, you know, to correspond to real organizations that are, you know, tend to be really nice for, for contributing to just because they, um, they tend to do open source in a you know, sort of well. So we, ha we have some lists of, uh, of those organizations here. And uh, you know, many many of those organizations are going to have a bunch of projects that you can contribute to. And so, you know, it's just a matter of sort of digging through, or maybe getting guidance about, you know, hey, where, what's what's the right place to contribute? What's a good match for my skills, etc. So, um, for tonight, we're going to look at uh, a project from where I work uh, called Dolores Landing. So, you know, I work in a 200-person team, and we have <coughs> new people joining pretty regularly, and with this, uh, you know, with all these new people joining, it's hard to onboard, you know, and it's hard to get people up to speed quickly. So the Dolores Landingham bot adds, uh, you know, once people are added to, to the organization on Slack, they then get sort of tips sent to them, uh, you know, as, the, as they're in the process of joining the company. So they, you know, will get a certain message on the first day saying like, hey, make sure like your, your email works and make sure that you, you know, filled out your, direct deposit or whatever it is. You know, three days later you might you know get an email get a message saying, hey, like you should go check through our like, you know, team practices and, and read this document over here. And then a week later, like, hey, make sure you've completed this training, etc. So it's a you know kind of trickle marketing campaign is another way of way of, uh, of of describing it. But it's open source and it has helped us onboarding people and I've actually uh, have heard of other organizations including some newspapers and, and other places that have reused it. So it's, it's a reusable thing and it's uh, relatively easy to get set up. So that's what we're gonna work on. Yeah, something to speak about before trying to make a contribution to this project is, <clears throat> I actually never set up this project in my computer. Yesterday night, we thought that this was going to be a good example and I tried it. And I really don't know how it works internally. I never seen the code and I, I wasn't a user even because I, I didn't get that onboarding process yet. And so I just put it in my computer, the software, and, and checked um, if they had contributing guidelines. First, I saw that the, well, the issues are well labeled and uh, more or less understandable for me. But what I was most interesting, interested in was this contributing document here. So I started reading it. And it says that this project follows a certain code of conduct that you should follow if you want to participate in this community and uh, how to start, so uh, here they suggest go to help wanted kind of issues. Yes. Oh yeah, thank you. So it says check the issues that are tagged as uh, help wanted, how do we use Git and so on, and somewhere they describe how to set up the project. So I started and downloaded the project, and I will show you in a second, and I could like run the tests already in my computer, so without understanding how the project worked, I could already have the software running in a way that I could possibly make already changes, for example, documentation. Like if I had found something in the contributing document that was confusing to me, I could have submitted it 
and it would have been uh, helpful for the maintainers of this project even if it's in a language that I never used. Because it could be, because I didn't even run it before. So just to add to that, you know, the, the, like a large contributing sort of uh, file or, or you know, page might seem kind of intimidating. Um, but I think you should actually read it as the opposite in that you know, this is a project or this is a community that thinks a lot about you know, bringing people in. And so, that, so they put a lot of time into, you know, okay, here are the kinds of things that we do as conventions, and here, here's the you know, sort of things you, you'll want to do to get set up, and you know, here's the most effective way to contribute, and here's, you know, how, we, you know, here's how you can help us in, in terms of triaging, et cetera. So contributing guidelines can sometimes be uh, you know, a little like, scary uh, at first, but <clears throat> think about it as you know, they, they've put a lot of time into trying to make it a welcoming place. Question? Could you talk no. more about labeling issues? Is that specific to GitHub, and how does it work? So yeah, it certainly is on GitHub. I assume there's something similar on, on those other platforms. I'm, I'm actually not sure. Yeah, but usually, basically, like, does it seem? Does the project seem like it's organized? You know, and that's just a subjective uh, kind of call. But like, you know, is it is it well documented? Is it um, you know? Do they have Know, sort of a roadmap or issues for things that they want to do, right? So you can get a sense of where the project's going. Are those things organized? Are they responding to questions? That kind of thing. Is that sort of, sort of so? Fun? So could you actually apply a label to an issue? Is it like tagging? Or yeah, it's like it's like tagging. It's something only the maintainers can do. But yeah, they'll they'll go and tag uh, issues. Often. Great, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was just wondering if there like the convention for labeling is different. Uh, Per project, or is there some general convention that people most adhere to, um, or it's just you know, the preset labels that give up revives, or they're just making their own conventions up? Or yeah, there are no conventions as far as I know. So GitHub does yeah. create ones by default. So often those are what people use, and you know they'll often like look the same. I'm like not aware of that. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so everyone's learning something. So, so, uh, so yeah, they're, they're, you often see things like feature or enhancement, something like that. Um, something like bug. Uh, something like uh, you know help wanted uh, or first timer issue or there's some others like that that are meant to convey like, hey, if you're just coming into a project, this is a good place to look. We'll get to we'll look at that more in a second. But um, yeah, so they're, they're sort of like defaults, but no, it's definitely not a not a standard. Cool. Yeah. Another comment I wanted to add is that <clears throat> as a newcomer, you have better visibility in what are the issues in the current project because the maintainers might have been working, let's say, for six months on it, and they might have forgotten to say that something has changed. So as a newcomer, you notice that because you never knew that context. They know it because they have been on that project for months, and that makes these kind of contributions very useful. It seems like some people think that they are confusing because you didn't yet learn about it, but no, they are confusing because there's yet no documentation in that step, or no nice error messages and things uh, like that. Yeah. So, yeah, you might also, um, you know, if you know the maintainer or have some way to talk to maintainers, uh, like if they have a chat room or something like that, uh, you know, rather than finding an issue yourself, you can also, you know, sort of ask, like, hey, like, do you have ideas or send them a tweet or whatever, like, hey, I'd love to contribute to this, like, do you have a suggestion about where to get started? I know, you know, Rails and, and jQuery or whatever it is, right? Um, so yeah, maintainers are usually pretty helpful, especially when you're trying to help them, right? Like, they're, they're, they're usually gonna be pretty, uh, pretty amenable. So, yeah, so, um, just to reiterate what Tute, what Tute said, you know, about getting this project set up, you don't have to know everything about a project in order to contribute to it. So he was able to run the tests without even reading any lines of code. And we didn't explicitly say yet that <clears throat> even contributing a question to the issue tracker is useful. Yeah. Because it, it shows that even if you don't know exactly where the error lies, just saying that something is weird to you is already useful because it shows that something needs to be done. Either the question be answered, Documentation being improved or, or something like that. So a new issue is always valuable. Yeah. 
even though they might direct you to Stack Overflow or they might direct you somewhere else or to the mailing list or whatever it might be. But yeah, po you know, posting questions is a good thing. And then following up with answers if you can find them. Yeah. So yeah. Should we start? Sounds good. So uh, I'll start uh, trying to make a contribution to this one project. There are the help wanted kind of uh, issues. So I'll search through them and ones that I like because they seem simple to me are the deprecation warnings. Ruby typically tells you what the syntax looks like right now and how it should look like, so it's very simple to fix. So we'll tackle that one issue. Here Jesse says, each time I run the test, there are all these deprecations, uh, so we would like to make them disappear. We would like to update the software. So I will start, because I can't push to this repository, because I am not a contributor. Uh, I'm not a contributor yet. Uh, I'll start by forking it, which means make a copy of the code as it is right now, but on my user account, where I can do whatever I want. This question. What, what's the deprecation warning? What's the deprecation warning? The deprecation warning is a message from the software you are using to warn you that in a future version of the software you are using, the things that you are solving right now with a certain syntax will be working on a different syntax. And so it advises you to change it now so that when you upgrade, you can continue to run your software healthily. Is that a good explanation? Yeah, it's a, uh, yeah, it's a warning that something is going to break later, so you should fix it now. Any other question? Okay, so I'll fork this project on my user account. <coughs> And now I have it. You'll notice that by, by forking, yeah, you can see that you know, this was originally at 18F slash Dolores Landingham. Now it's under two days, two days account. So he now has his own copy that he can work on. So now I can clone it down on my computer. Yeah, while he does that and, and uh, goes through the setup, um, you know, he mentioned it a little bit, but there's lots of ways to contribute to projects. So obviously, Fixing bugs is a huge one. Um, improving documentation is an arguably huger one uh, because, frankly, there aren't that many people who want to do it. And the maintainers are not in the best place to do it because they don't understand what's confusing to a new person uh, coming into that project. So there's those things. There's adding tests, you know, of um, like, hey, I found this, this your quirk of the functionality, or I, I found this bug. Here's a test showing that showing that it breaks. Uh, or, or here's an example. Uh, here's some example code. Uh, it might be confirming an open bug. You know, helping helping a maintainer's triage. So, you know, saying like, hey, I also experienced this. Here's what operating system I'm using. Here's what version of Ruby or whatever. Um, you might make an example app that shows how to use the thing, right? So, a sort of guide for for other people. You can, you know, contribute design, right? So it doesn't even have to be technical. You can say like, hey, like I thought I'd make you a logo, or I thought I'd, you know, improve the, the colors or improve the accessibility or whatever on your on your documentation site. Uh, you can answer other people's questions, etc. So there's tons of there's tons of ways to to you know give to projects, and people will be immensely grateful. So here I saw in the contributing document that I had a setup script which I run and it set up all the dependencies. It installed the gems and set up the database and so on. And now I run the tests running rake and we can see that all just passed which we expected and so we are happy about that. Sometimes it doesn't happen. And we see also uh, the, the provision warning. So let's start with this one. Ruby says that we are using get show syntax but the new version will be process and send in the me and send in the method as an option hash. So yeah, in case it's not clear, the, the the warning that we're looking at is between, you know, this sort of section here. So it says deprecation warning, such and such, you know, later HTTP requests will accept only keyword arguments in future Rails versions, right? So it's going to break later. You need to do something. And so here's how to fix it. And they give an example. So open that file. Yeah. Suggesting like, how, how to fix it. Yeah. So this is particularly friendly uh, in that yeah, it's it's telling us how to fix it. Sometimes you aren't so lucky, but yeah, in this case, the, the issue is you know make the deprecation warnings go away by 
doing whatever they say to. Is there a reason for uh, forking it as opposed to just cloning the uh, regular brand <coughs> directly making a pull request? Yeah, in my case, I can't push to 18F repository, oh, so I wouldn't be able to. Yeah, that's right. I don't have the permission to do that. Do the contributors see when you, how does that work when you want to come to pull request? Do you just, do you just tag it? We'll see it. it. Yeah, we'll show you. Yeah, we'll go. <laughs> Okay, so now in the left, I have the command to run only that file that shows all these messages. And on the right, I have the code. So let's see, it's asking us to say process instead of, instead of post. And then send in the method as an option. Save the file and run the test again. <coughs> and I did something wrong. Process create method post, <laughs> what was it? <laughs> it's it's That's great. So yeah, sometimes you'll have to kind of play around, right, to figure out uh, exactly... Oh, uh, I have exactly to say params here. Say params, yeah. So, in this case, this will happen, right? So the message was telling us something, trying to change it, but we didn't change it right, and that caused an error, right? So at this point, this is you know just general troubleshooting in that, okay, we now want to walk like sort of trace back our steps and say, okay, have we actually followed the directions? Let's go back and look at what it said. Look at you know what we changed. Is it what we think it is? It should be, and then you know act accordingly. So run it again. Drum roll. Oh yeah. Yeah, nice. and now we don't see the error or the provision. <laughs> We have uh, two other deprecation warnings that we'll fix until this command uh, looks clean, and then we'll send the PR. First, I will fix the time zone. No, I'm fixing the, the HTTP request ones. And then we have the time zones, which is a different one, and we can do as part of our commit. So this is a broadcast messages controller spec. So there might be, you know, in this case, there are, this deprecation warning appears in multiple places. So we're going to go and fix all of those at the same time, and we'll deal with the other warnings later. So fix that syntax, run the test, and no more migration problems. Uh, no more uh, <laughs> So now we can do a commit and push it to my fork, and now we will send the pull request to 18F. So, uh, fix test unit, HTTP related deprecation warnings. So, th so something that you might not be familiar with, uh, if you're just, you know, sort of working in Git um, yourself, or you know, with, with other students, et cetera, is that you know, commit messages are really helpful to projects uh, to you know, be able to understand in a, in a very uh, concise way you know, what that change was. And so when they're looking at back later, of like, oh wait, how did, this, how did this thing happen? They can just read that really quickly without having to actually look at the code changes. So as you know, this and I thought, two different types of errors. Would you fix both of those errors at the same time? Uh, do you, you fix one air and do one commit and then do the other air and then fix that commit? What do you recommend? It's subjective. Um, Either works. Yeah, there's not really a right answer. I mean, what I would <coughs> probably, eh. What we're going to do anyway is fix all, fix the sets of uh, deprecation warnings in separate commits. You could just make a contribution to fix one type of deprecation warning, or just one deprecation warning if you really wanted. You know, there's nothing wrong with that per se. But yeah, usually you want, you know, um, well, depend on the project. Sometimes they just want one commit for everything that you're doing, and therefore the pull request should stay like pretty well scoped. Other projects, they don't care. So. So that's the right question, I would think of the contributor receiving the pull request. In this case, the change is like five lines of a difference, and it's about the application warnings. The other change, I think, is also equally small. So probably a single commit for that person won't be, it won't take a lot of time on, that per, on their person receiving this change set to understand what's going on. So I'll probably do it in the same commit. 
I would think about that, like how easy or hard is it to understand what's happening in this change set. Um, in this case, I would probably do it in the same commit. Yeah. But you could do a commit saying, you could do a commit saying like, fix HTTP duplication warnings, and then another commit saying, fix whatever the other warning is, and do that as one sort of proposed change, which is GitHub is called a, a pull request. But yeah, I mean, it's this is subjective, and often the contributor guidelines, especially for bigger projects, will say like, you know, please just have one commit, or please like structure it in this way, et cetera. Uh, I was just admiring your workflow and wondering what editor you were using in general. Is this Vim? That's Vim and Tmax. Vim and Tmax. 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 Yeah. For having the many windows. Okay, so I will push to my to my repository and check GitHub again and see what changed. So before the last commit was from Jesse, but we are on my fork. Now that I pushed, if I reload, I see that I have a new commit here, which is the one that we just did. So with this, we can hit this pull request button that says, because we are one commit ahead, we can share this commit with 18F. So I will open it up now. I should, well, anyway, it's there. So I will send the pull request. And it says, let's see, <laughs> create pull request. And here we can say, oh, nice. We have a template to explain what, what is this addressing. I love it. So I go 228. 228, thank you. It says reference the number of issue that you are addressing, 228. Fixes the test case. HCP, deprecation, HAP methods, deprecation warning. Thank you. Um, we don't need to CC, or maybe I will CC Jesse, who. Person that reported it. Who reported the issue first, yes. So that she can review this change and maybe merge it. So create the pull request. And now it's there in 18F. It's a new pull request that the person can comment on and see if it makes sense and if it's better or not and a discussion might happen here. So I could have yeah, what, so, so yeah, what you're saying uh, in this pull request, if, you, if you've never uh, made one on a project that has this set up, uh, you see the little orange dot and the orange message down here. What this is actually doing is running uh, what's called continuous integration or like automated testing. So this project is built with automated tests in that there is code that checks to make sure the code is doing what it's supposed to. So whenever you make a new pull request, it will kick off those tests and run it through a system, in this case called Travis CI, but there are a bunch of others. And uh, today you can click on that. And now it's, uh, he's gonna see that it's actually running, um, first it's setting up the dependencies, and then it's doing a bundle install, you know, doing a bundle install, is getting Ruby up here, uh, and then setting up the database, setting up the .env file, right? So it's doing the things that you would do kind of on your computer, but it's doing it in an automated way. So we do still see the time zone deprecation warning, but that's not, um, that's fine. You know, we would accept that exact change. And so all we're doing here is checking to make sure that the deprecation warning that we meant to fix is fixed. And it's especially important that it doesn't just work on our computer, right? This is a way to sort of run it in a, somewhere out in, in space and you know ensure that it works uh, here as well. So we don't see the error, and therefore um, we're good to go. So Tute, since, he's not, since he doesn't work for HNF, he doesn't have the ability to change the canonical version. All he can do is submit a pull request to propose the change. I, however, do work at 18F, and so when I go to the same page, I see basically the same thing, but with a big green button at the bottom that says merge. And so what I can do is go in and leave a message And maybe I'd, I'd leave some um, 
you know, feedback on the code or whatever, but in this case, uh, I'm not going to. So I'm just gonna click the big green merge code button. And now, Tutu has contributed to this project. Yeah, yeah, so just to show that, you know, now this code is not only existing in his copy, but if we go back to the original, which is the, you know, the canonical version, we can actually see that the latest commit, well, it's from me, but if you click uh, commit, it's too thick. Yeah. We can now see that his change uh, has been incorporated. So that now works. Yeah. When Tute made the pull request and the template came up for the commit, yeah. for the pull request message, how did that template come to exist? So yeah, GitHub added a feature pretty recently uh, called issue and pull request templates. So if you have this specially named file, um, any new uh, pull request or you know, issues will use that sort of structure. That's awesome. Yeah, it's pretty. Can you do those CI steps before it finalizes the pull request? So if it fails, you don't just harass other people with the... Uh... So usually you'd want to run it locally, right? Like you, like he was doing. Mm -hmm. The CI is really just like a final you know, okay. a final check. So you, yeah, usually you want to run that stuff on your own. I did the setup step after cloning the repository. That was the first step in CI. Okay. And then each time I make a change, I run the tests with a command rake. Right. A rake test. Yeah. So all the stuff in Travis is the same as the one by just running those commands? Typically, yes. Yes. Or, or, or close. Or very yes. Is your personal fork now updated, like live updated from It is not. So that change happens in, in the 18F fork. In mine, I still see as latest commits commit this one and not the merge commit that Aiden just made. Right. So if I want, well, yeah, it's, it's not. How, I would should you, how would you update your, your fork to be um, up to date? Is it okay to re git remote? So, yeah, sure. okay. So let's say. Uh, Tutu had been working on this for a while, and um, or, or rather, he had done that change a while ago, right. and there had been subsequent changes on the project, you know, from from other people. And Tutu now wants to make sure he's up to date. Yeah, so, so how do you update your your copy? If I do get pull, pull by default, it will pull from Origin, and Origin, my repository, is uh, is my copy Tutu. So what I do typically in this case is to fetch new commit from from upstream is going to that uh, copy of the repository, checking the URL for them. I can't push there, but I can pull because it's publicly accessible. And what I do is adding it as a new remote called upstream, or I could call it 18F2. So remotes are ways to basically point at the GitHub repository that you're interacting, or, or the Git repository that you're interacting with on the other side. So, right, so you might have one for the canonical version, you might have one for the fork, um, if you wanted to also push it to Bitbucket or something, you could add that as a remote, right? So the remotes are just like ways of connecting your your copy on your computer to other places. So if I, the, I do a fetch from Origin, nothing happens. But if I do from the new remote called AppStream, then I see that new changes come through. And I can see that my tree, I have my help pointing to the develop of my copy of Origin. But upstream has a new commit, the merge commit. So what I do is say that my develop should be merged with upstream develop. I do that, and I check the tree again, and now my help points to the new one. But origin is still the old one, because I didn't push that change. So if I reload in my copy, it still shows my commit and not Aiden's. So in this case, I now can do push, and it added that change that I fetched from from upstream into origin. So I can reload here in in Tute and it has Aidan's commit. So yeah, when you when you merge it actually makes a new commit for you, just that way. So when you do git push without any specification, it will automatically push to origin? Yeah. The same with pool and fetch, yes. And the the command to see the tree that was well git tree. Sorry. Uh, so two days are this pretty like tricked out uh, terminal yeah. setup. <laughs> um, Log graph uh, pretty one line I think it is. 
Yeah, and then something to make the sh the share numbers. It, he'll po we'll, we'll post it in the in the meetup. But yeah, yeah, he basically made like an alias for a longer. Something custom in your gaming thing. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So we made the changes. Yeah. So we'll as as you're making changes, just to just to reiterate. Um, you know, the first thing that you're going to want to do is get the application set up. We actually didn't even do that step. Uh, and then make sure the tests run uh, on your computer. Because then, as you modify the code, or add new tests, or change things, uh, you can run the tests to, you know, quickly see if you've broken anything. Right? And so, you want to be able to run those things locally, and, and as you make a change, you run the tests, as you make a change, you run the tests, and ensure that uh, things can yeah. I'm not sure if you're going to cover this uh, later on, but if you did want, um, as a job seeker, a potential employer to see your, your contributions or your research projects, um, one, how do they look? I guess, do they look at the community history? And also, how do you tell, like, how do you point them to like, look at the specific people? Yeah, so now that Tudor's done a contribution, uh, if he goes to his GitHub profile, uh, and this is in an incognito window, so it'll look like it would to, a, um, to an external person. Tudor does a lot of contributions, but you can actually see in this activity log down at the bottom that he's made this commit and he opened this pull request. So yeah, that's where it'll show up. If you're contributing to documentation, if you're just reading, you know, you're correcting grammar or something in docs. How do you show your work for something like that? It's the same. Same thing. Yeah. Same thing. It's all. It's also pull requests on GitHub. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Usually. Usually. Okay. Unless it's like in a wiki or something like that. Okay. But yeah, if the if the um, documentation lives as files in a repository, it's the exact same thing. And Tutek can actually go back to that repository and show like the README. For example, uh, if you want to open up the code locally. So yeah, that README file is just a file. You know, the README that shows up is just a file in the repository. It just happens to have a special name. I wonder if we can make it fix. Yeah, it looks pretty. <laughs> so are we for game? Oh, go go back to the pull request actually. So Jesse, uh, the coworker out in uh, San Francisco, actually commented already, and so now Tute would have gotten an email, and you know I would have gotten an email since I was involved in this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you can get this same message if you fix the time zone issue. <laughs> we should, it should be a race. <laughs> If I wanted to just contribute to documentation, um, do I have to fire up like my terminal and my editor and all that where I can actually do it like in GitHub? You're asking really good questions. It's yeah. a really good thing that we fed them to you. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah, it's interesting because the, it's much simpler. You don't need to fork because it, GitHub has this pencil here. Even though I don't have access to, to it in F, I get the pencil here. And if I click on edit, it will fork the project for me automatically if I don't already have it. And it will take me to a form where I can just edit it from the browser. And then when I hit save, it's going to create a pull request and everything for you without needing to download anything to your computer or run any code. So if you're just making a small change, uh, like in a single file, this is a really good way to do it. Is that, is that only with like markdown read repos or is that any file on your repository? Any file. If you're doing code though, like if it's not just like correcting a comment or something like that, you'll you probably want to do it on your computer. Because you'll want to run the tests and make sure that the application still loads and that kind of thing. With the continuous integration, like what tests is that running is that, is that running the same tests that I would run locally or is that a different set of tests? So yeah, the, the like contributing file I think said how to set up the project and how to run the tests. 
um, for, for things like Travis uh, or CircleCI or other systems like this, uh, usually you're gonna have a sort of file in here that describes how to, to describe to that system how to run the tests. So yeah, this is the contributing file that says, you know, okay, if you're, if you're running this, here's how you do the setup, et cetera, and here's how you run the test, which is by running break. For, for you know, telling the machine to run the, to run the tests, that's gonna be done um, not, in, not in a documentation file, but in a configuration file. So if we go and look at the Travis.yaml, this is a program oh, formatting that you oh, yeah. that you can right now open the pencil in this file, contributing, and fix that one for, for everyone. There's some formatting issue there. Let's see what it is. Um, oh, it's because there are two ticks in line 180 instead of three. If you put a third one, it will look better for everyone. Please do it. <laughs> <laughs> so you were mentioning the Travis file. Yeah, so, so for Travis, you use a .travis.yaml file. And this has a bunch of things, but it will specifically say, okay, before, uh, you know, sort of first, like, copy the .env file, um, run the, da the database setup, it will by default do bundle install. Uh, that's just how Travis works. Uh, and then, you know, run it using Ruby 231, and the test script should be bundle exec rake, Right, so this is what's actually telling it how to run the tests. And you know, this is a more complicated configuration file. Usually it'll be much simpler, but yeah, they, this is what tells Travis what to do. So the test that's that actually, that the tests, uh, that conf file is being told to run, are those? So Travis, Travis looks for a .travis.yaml file, okay. reads through it, and then says, oh, okay, you're telling me to Run this as like the and test. Those tests are like sweet apps, sweet tests, right? Mm -hmm. the same. Yep. So it's, yeah, it's the exact same command you'd run cool. locally. Sometimes it'll say like, you know, rake CI tests or something yeah. like that because they have to change something for, for the test environment versus running locally. But they'll usually be pretty simple. So who's taking the time zone uh, deprecation warning and who's <laughs> taking the formatting and contributing file? <laughs> If we're claiming, I'll take the time Okay, go. there we go. What are the formatting and contributing file for Dolores? And if you fix it, you get a free beer. <laughs> <laughs> Just a general question about open source. This is not really about how to like, um, contribute or anything like that, but just from like a business standpoint, um, how do you protect yourself from like another company or another competitor just like, stealing your code and using it their own? Do you answer? Uh, many thoughts. Do you have one of the top I, of your I, brain? I also have many thoughts. Okay, <laughs> you start. All right. Uh, you don't. Um, basically, if your code is the only thing that makes your idea valuable, then it's not a valuable idea. That's my very strong opinion. <laughs> so. Um, you know, often projects that you see, like Thoughtbot, you know, Thoughtbot, for example, maybe isn't a great example because they're not a product company so much as like a consultancy, but Facebook, right? Facebook, their main application is not open source. You can't like run your own Facebook, but they open source components, right? Things like React, things like um, OS Query, I don't know, a bunch of other projects, right? Uh, those things are not what make Facebook valuable. Right? Arguably, the code that runs Facebook is not what makes Facebook valuable, right? It's that people use it. So, um, so yeah, you'll most often see companies open sourcing parts of their of their applications and part of their stacks that are not like the business value. Um, so components and things that they use and that are important, but it isn't like it isn't like the thing. But yeah, I, I mean, this is my opinion, but. Uh, you know, I, I I wouldn't get too hung up about it. I thought, but sorry. Google search algorithm. Yeah. What, what about it? Google I couldn't do anything with that Google. software. Well, <laughs> if you steal it, you could probably sell it for quite a bit. We are late to the game, I, I think. Yeah, you're right. I, I mean, that doesn't give you like Google.com, right? Like people use Google because they know to go to Google. It's not. You will know how to cheat. Ah, so yeah. SEO. I mean, yeah. yeah. So sure. So right. 
so this is this here, okay here's a real problem or here's a real thing so you know um, I work in government and we hear the argument sometimes from people uh, that we work with saying like oh open source is less secure because people can see your code right so they can see what the vulnerabilities are well while that's true that al it also means by having your code available that also means that there might be you know um, good people looking for vulnerabilities to tell you about them right so by having the open source by having the code open source arguably you're making it easier to see by you know malicious people but you're also making it easier to see by generous people and so um, yeah it sort of nets out where you know it's not you, there are a ton of benefits and this is like it's like a small downside that I personally think is that way so yes you could right if you knew Google's um, you know search algorithm yeah maybe that could help you to improve your rankings but like that's not going to give you like a million things linking to your page right so like if they're yeah I mean if, if their algorithm were not you know had a problem with it where you could cheat it like that would be a problem regardless so open sourcing like there the benefits far outweigh those those negative outcomes in my opinion was there a question here? Was there another question? Yeah, gentleman in the third row. Oh uh, no, I was yeah, I was just going to add to that because I mean, is there yeah, is there any data indicating that um, you know open source projects are are like hack more or have you know more uh, malicious attacks on them? Like I, I would expect not probably. I mean. What, what's the number? Like ninety percent of of, uh, of of servers on the internet like run on open source. So like you can't even do a comparison really because mm -hmm. everything uses open source. So um, no, I don't know of any. Is the I guess the short answer. But uh, yeah, they're you know Apache, Nginx, Ubuntu, Red Hat, like all of these things are open source and they're like what make the internet work, right? And yeah, so you know, everyone else trusts them. <laughs> so I, th I think it's a, it's a pretty safe bet. Yes. How do you uh, go about finding open source projects? Are there, are there websites or? Yeah, so uh, in that section of the doc, um, we, we link to a few like organizations that might be good to look at. Uh, there's also a section of resources um, that actually have to scroll up. So we are so, yeah. here. Yep, so, so you know, link to a few organizations. This is a project that's particularly good uh, for contributing to um, on the Hacker Hours website, which is a uh, you know, meetup that we, that we both organize. This, uh, you know, that, that has lists of lists of projects. So there's no shortage of projects out there. And this is where, again, I would emphasize, <laughs> you know, trying to find ways to contribute to projects that you use. This website on the right is hackerhours.org slash resources, the HTML. And there's a great list of lists there. Can we get access to that, um, all of these links? It's Did it's already posted on the Meetup. On the Meetup, so... On the I, Meetup event page. So you probably got an email or something. I, well, if I didn't actually sign up for that Meetup, I could still... <laughs> yeah. We will make sure they get the real okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll, find, we'll find the link after this. How valuable or useful is it for like a junior developer or somebody just learning to make code to go to these open source um, projects and just look at the code? Uh, how, how much can you learn from looking at the code? Is that the question? Yeah, or like, is it even like worth? The way I think about it is, I always get started because I have a bug that doesn't allow me to finish the task I am on. So uh, let's say that I'm building a file upload system and it doesn't work for PNG files. And I need it to work for PNG files. And the reason it doesn't work is not in my application, but in the library. So I need to work through it anyway. And, and, I, and then I go into that project, issue tracker, and start working with the maintainers. Maybe I don't understand the code, maybe it's new to me, this library, but the maintainers is a bug. 
and it will be in their best interest to help you uh, fix this one particular bug as well because it's their library and they want it to be useful for everyone and they will teach you through the process uh, so that you can both uh, fix it. So reading code, in my personal case, I don't find it as as uh, illuminating as trying to work through it and like have to read it because I have to modify it and run the test and see if I break anything else on the other side and discuss it with the current maintainers and people who have more experience in this code base. Uh, I learn a lot by changing and typically the motivation of that, of that is a bug that's right in my in my roadmap. Does what that answer the question? What, what I would say is that like, you know, even if you're not like ready to contribute yet, you know, next time you are using a gem or something like that and you know, find a find a, a new method or new option or something like that that you use, like instead of just reading the documentation or copying an example or something like that, actually go and like look where that method is defined, right? And try and read through that. And then look at the things that calls and and go and search through that. And you know, you'll start to, to get a sense, especially, again, bigger projects, of how things are organized. And you know, usually there's a lot of very experienced people with a lot of time put into you know, building it that way. So yeah, there's definitely, definitely things you can do. But again, like, you know, doing it, rather than just jumping into a random project, doing it where you have a little bit of context and see, OK, I know how this is being used in my application. Now, what's it actually doing under the hood? That's going to be a little bit more uh, instructive. So I'd probably start that, that way. And if you have more experience in Rails applications, let's say, then start on a Rails application that's itself open source. So Exorcism has many projects, but among them, they have their web application open. I, I, I think it's a Sinatra app, actually, right? Uh, now it's Rails. So this is an application written in Rails, and so it might look more familiar in case you want to contribute to a bigger, a bigish Rails application. So find uh, yeah, find one that that's not in your comfort zone, but close enough that you can actually just outside. Yeah, just just there, like on the other side of the fence. Do you find that contributors are generally um, accepting of people who are who might be intimidated by contributing to projects like that? There's everything, and that's the reason we suggest to look at the issue tracker and the pull requests to see how the interactions between different people go. Because there are people who are not welcoming, there are people who are lovely, there are people who are really, really helpful, there are people who are just hateful. Right. There's everything, it's just so many people working together. You will find everything. So I recommend checking how they work, seeing who are the people more active in the project and seeing how they interact with new people and, and people they already know and see if you want to participate in that group or not. Yeah, I'd also say like it doesn't hurt to, you know, if it's your first contribution, just say like, hey, this is my first time contributing, let me know, you know, if I can do anything better or something like that. Right? Leave it open for that. Yeah. Um, so so obviously as a, a job seeker, like any contributions are better than nothing. Um, but I'm curious if you have any thoughts about you know what uh, you know what an employer might really like to see uh, you know, as far as contributions go, like things that are big pluses versus something that's less, you know, uh, less attractive or impressive. You go first. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it's hard to speak for every employer, but you know, what I personally would look for is, you know, not all, okay. Do they have? Does this person have their own projects open sourced? Right? Are they and how well organized? How well documented are they? Um, have they, you know, contributed to other projects, you know, things that they depend on, things that they, you know, found bugs in or, or thought of features for or, you know, wanted to improve the design of or the documentation of, right? Are they are they good communicators? Like do they do they do they write well, do they explain well, do they um, you know, ask good questions, that kind of thing. So yeah, you know, not just one word answers, not just um, yeah. yeah, yeah. I would say contributing things that are like bigger than themselves, or, or you know, trying to give back. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in that. And I would say study who you are interviewing with. Like, if you have a company in mind, see what they value very much. Do they value the human interaction? Do they value code quality? Do they value a certain coding standard? Do they value a certain class of problems like performance problems or like code readability problems? 
and optimize for that in your contributions so that you can say I'm going to contribute to your organization in changes that look very much like this one that I link to you right now. Or if they have an open source project, can you contribute something like before your interview? Like, how cool would that be to like <laughs> be able to walk in and say like, oh yeah, like I found a I found a bug, <laughs> I fixed it for you. If you pay me right now, I already work for you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, in the interest of uh, of uh, ending on time, I think we just wanted to say, um, you know. Don't be afraid. Uh, you know, this is everyone has to, you know, do something for the first time, and so you know, don't be afraid to reach out for help. I'm sure um, you know the .boot camp staff are, are very willing to mentor. Uh, at Hacker Hours, we're, we're very willing to mentor uh, two ten nine individually as well. Um, you know, and maintainers like, don't be afraid to reach out to them. Just you know, be honest. Say like, hey, I'm trying to contribute, or I'm trying to build up my portfolio. I'd love to, you know, contribute your project that kind of thing um, yeah don't forget you know check the contribution guidelines like read the documentation that's there um, <coughs> because that information is for you um, yeah and then just remember that maintainers are busy so if you don't you know get get a response or get a response right away like don't take it personally just you know give them a nudge after a week or, or whatever so um, yeah I think yeah, check out uh, check out Hacker Hours. You know, have have uh, you know ask ask the, the teachers here for for help uh, if you're contributing, and uh, yeah, find someone to pair with. You know, find someone else who wants to contribute and work through it together. Has any one of you gone to a Hacker Hours meetup? Okay, yeah, just a couple. one, yeah, a couple of hands. Uh, that meetup is incredible because it's people who go with computers to work together. And there are like one a day at least, sometimes there are two a day in different parts of the city. And people go with the intention of working on their projects and of helping too. And the organizer of the meetup is typically mentoring our people who attend. So that's a perfect spot to learn uh, more deep into the wits about concrete coding problems. And you can find that on um, meetup.com? Hackerhouse.org, I'll post the link. Is there one more hand? One more question? So I would like to say thank you very much to to, to Adia. Uh, <laughs> on a final note, uh, next Wednesday we're gonna actually host Hacker Hours here at DBC. So please go to meetup.com and sign up for that. You can either sign up at DBC uh, Group or at Hacker Hours group, if you like. Um, also, please sign up for the Hacker Hours Slack channel, and you can, by being on that, contributing to any questions or inquiries that may be there as well. Uh, here at DPC, we will definitely uh, move in to be more active in the open source contributions. Uh, so every month, we're actually gonna host a Hacker Hour here. So uh, if you can come on Wednesday, uh, please see if you can come any other day uh, to the Hacker Hours. Uh, there'll be a lot of senior developers, there'll be a lot of networking, and you're definitely gonna have a lot of hands-on. So bring your laptops and start coding. Thank you everybody for coming around.